So good evening, everyone in Japan. Uh, good morning. Uh, good evening, everyone in Japan. Good morning, everyone in uh, Europe and beyond. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today for another session at the European Literature Festival. Today, we're most happy uh, to welcome the acclaimed Belgian writer, Stefan Hertmans. Stefan Hertmans was already considered to be our guest at the festival last year, but was not able uh, to make it because of uh, Corona, we all know about, but um, today we're most pleased he is here with us and ready to talk and interact with a mostly uh, Japanese audience. And this is without uh, any doubt a first, and we take uh, pride in this. So Stefan Hetmans is probably one of uh, the most prolific contemporary writers in the Low Countries. There is almost no genre that he has not been uh, touching upon. Poetry, uh, novels, short stories and travel stories, essays, theater texts, reviews, columns, you name it, he's mastering them all. His work has been uh, translated in almost all the uh, European languages. Stefan has been lecturing uh, till quite an advanced age and in Belgium as well as uh, brought. Stefan Hermans has also won or been nominated for most of the uh, literary prizes. He is uh, an intellectual who is continuously uh, feeding and making contributions to the public uh, debate. And War and Turpentine is without any doubt his masterpiece for which he has given international praise. And this is the book that uh, we will be uh, speaking about today. It is uh, considered to be a real gem of a novel, full of history, uh, full of life, and above all, uh, full of wisdom. And it is that, exactly that wisdom, that we hope uh, Stefan will be sharing with us today. But before uh, giving him the floor, there is two things I would like to, to point out. So War and Turpentine has been translated into Japanese since last year. So it is available in most of the bookstores. So uh, I, I hope that some of you have already read it. And if not, um, you are uh, free to, to buy it and certainly do so uh, after this session. And uh, one more thing is, um, we will be uh, reserving time for Q&A. So there is for you an opportunity to ask uh, questions. So we ask you to, uh, to use the function of the, the chat function. So in that uh, chat function, you can um, phrase your question in whatever language you like, in Dutch, in English, in Japanese. Um, please uh, do so without any hesitation. And so after say uh, three quarters, we will be reserving time for your uh, questions and for Q&A. So um, without further ado, I give now the floor to uh, Stefan Hertmans. Hello. Uh, first, let me thank uh, Mr. Ben Akatris for this uh, fantastic introduction and for the cooperation we had. In the second place, I would like to thank the European uh, Literature Festival for this occasion to talk about my book, War and Turpentine, which was originally published as Orlog and Turpentine. Orlog is war, is a very old Flemish word, um, which if you think about the French word for a clock is an horloge. And it will, I will be talking about the clock of my grandfather, and I will be talking about time and about the horlogerie of history of time a lot. We should imagine that the story of my grandfather is the story of um, a boy born at the end of the 19th century in 1891 in a very poor Flemish family. Flandern is now a very rich modern country, but was then as the northern part of Belgium was very poor. And my grandfather came out of a poor family, uh, very modest people, but there was something very special. His mother had great talents, 
was in fact an intellectual woman, a very strong uh, personality, and his father was a church painter. That means his father earned his living by painting the Catholic saints in a Catholic Flemish old churches and, and chapels. So all this was very modest. They lived uh, with their children um, in a very small house in the neighborhood of a town in Flanders, which is called Ghent. And this old world for me was also a revelation when I read in my grandfather's memoirs how the details had been of his life in that period, which was really a different planet from what we are knowing now. Um, I must say that the memoirs of my grandfather had been given to me in 1981 um, because he felt he was going to die. And when I was visiting him the last time, he gave me his notebooks. We all knew in the family that my grandfather had written about the First World War and the traumas of the killing fields in Flanders, but nobody had read them. They were in his drawer, in his room. Um, and he had been painting all of his life. That's how I knew him. Um, so they were a secret. He gave them to me in 1981. And I waited almost 30 years before I wrote this book because it was a very complicated matter. I was afraid of reading them, afraid of the emotions that were going to open for me. And since I've always been a teacher in a, a high school, I thought I have no time to write this huge family story, which is also the story of Flanders and Belgium. As you might know, in very many languages in Europe, great novels have been written about the First World War, which was the first great technological modern war. People were not prepared for the power and the craft of warfare of that period. And as we have seen in very many languages, great novels were evoking the terrible tortures, the terrible suffering in the trenches. And this being stuck up in the mud for years in a situation where people saw their, their brothers, their, their, their friends being killed almost every day when, when casualties fell. So this was really a traumatic war. And the strange thing is that in Flanders, we were almost one of the most important killing fields then. There were no great novels about this. It is as if the Flemish have been keeping shut and silent about this. Um, because I think very many of the witnesses had the idea, you cannot explain to other generation what this has been. So I felt the task and some of my colleagues as well in Flanders, I'm not the only one, but it's only since some 10, 12 years that we have published great novels on the First World War, a hundred years later. While for instance, in English, we had great novels, Robert Graves, uh, we had great novels in English, we had great novels in German, in Swedish, in Italian. But the Flemish only have started writing about it now. I think this has to do with the complex situation of Belgium also. Flemish soldiers for 70% have defended Belgium. And afterwards, they have felt left alone after the war. My grandfather has remained poor. What he got as a sort of pension after the war was even not enough to live from. He lived in the house with my parents where I have spent my youth. So the very special thing is that this great hero of the First World War, as I will explain to you, was in fact a man who was my best friend in my youth. He was a very, um, uh, a man with great fantasy. I mean, he was in fact very romantic and the, the, the genius is that in fact, he was a man with great joy in his life. He learned me to listen to classical music. He learned me to, to play skirmish as the knights did in the Middle Ages. He made small daggers and swords for me in wood in order to learn me in the old way as he had learned it, to be a dignified soldier with the sword. 
he, he learned me to paint in oil paint. I had my own small easel and we went out in the woods and he learned me to paint as the old painters in post Renaissance painted. So this war hero was for me just the, the hero and the friend of my youth. So when after 30 years waiting, I opened his notebooks and his memoirs, it's not journals. He has himself started writing these very important memoirs about the First World War 50 years later. And the interesting thing is, I will let uh, show Bernard one image of his handwriting uh, later on. We have them on it's the image uh, number eight, Bernard, if you can show that. Um, number eight. Yes, exactly. There they are. So if you show these, you will see the handwriting of my grandfather. This is the handwriting of a man who lived very long ago. Here on this page, he describes one of the most um, cruel battles in Flanders fields, the battle at Epicam. And as you can see, there are almost no words which he erased. He has written this 50 years after the war without erasing a word. He had it all in his head, more than 600 pages. You can see at the bottom of the page as one word where he has corrected himself a bit. But mostly of the time, there are no corrections. This man has written this as if he has had this in his head for 50 years. There is almost no soldier who did this. So this makes his testimony, of course, something very important. And I felt I had to make a book out of this. But what you should also bear in mind is that the Flemish and the Dutch language, because we are one language, Dutch and Flemish, is almost the same. Our language has modernized enormously in 100 years. The Flemish in those notebooks of my grandfather is very old fashioned Flemish. I could not just type them out and publish them. It was impossible. People of today would not be able to read it in a fluent way. So I had to invent the book again. Thank you, Bernard, for the image. And um, what happened, of course, to me is that I came into a situation of how to remain loyal to this man's beautiful stories in the first place describing not the war but describing the poverty of his youth in flanders we have an image uh, it's image number two bernard where you see the world of 1900 and you will be able to see this image just in a few seconds Uh, where we will see that still the trams, for instance, the trams were not electrified in his days. The trams were still being drawn by horses. There was almost no electricity in the houses. Um, so all of this primitive world was the world where people were living in. Now, to explain you a bit the situation of Belgium, we had nothing to do with the cause and the origins of the First World War. Nothing whatsoever. Belgium is, as you might know, a country with three languages and originally with two. French speaking in Brussels and Bologna and Dutch Flemish speaking in Flanders in the north. But originally this, the Belgium state was founded as a one language French speaking state. So the Germans considered us as automatically solidar in solidarity with France. So when the First World War breaks out, we are being seen as the immediate um, collaborator of the French. And the idea of the German people was the German army to attack France by coming through Belgium. We, of course, weren't prepared. We thought that the original, there you have the image of the youth of my grandfather, which is really a world of long ago. Let me wait for the image to enlarge, if it's possible. <clears throat> exactly, thank you. There you see, and even in Flanders, you see there is Obo Marché, 
de les frères, the official language in Flanders was also French at that moment. But what was happening in the Habsburg reign with the killing of um, the, the sovereign of the Habsburg in Sarajevo in 1914, we were not prepared in Flanders to bear the consequences of this deed. But when Germany wants to attack France, they come through Belgium. And from the first day on, the whole Belgian army, you can give the next image maybe, Bernard, which is the South Station. Uh, this is my grandfather's, uh, yeah. There is the South Station, next one. No. Well, anyhow, it's okay. Yes, that's the one, thank you. This is a South Station, which afterwards was uh, destroyed. It uh, even doesn't exist anymore. This is the place where all the soldiers from my hometown, Ghent, were gathering and were sent to a war of which they had no idea what it was going to become. From the first day on, the German armies have been very cruel to the Belgian population. They said that Belgians were killing German soldiers. The Belgians couldn't kill German soldiers. Their weapons were still weapons from the War of Napoleon, so to speak. We were not prepared for the modern warfare. So Belgium was immediately completely taken in. For just one small part in the west, near the coast of the North Sea, the Belgians have been stuck up and have resisted for a very long time. If you can go to the next um, picture, you will see my grandfather, as we have found, um, there it is, as we have found the drawing when he came back from the war. This is a bit fake, ladies and gentlemen. This is written underneath this. This is how Urbain, his name was Urbain Martin, how Urbain Martin returned from the war. Of course, they didn't return from the war like this. They returned in, in rags and tatters and the mud completely destroyed. But some of the heroes like he, who had been wounded five times, were then dressed again in an official Belgian uniform with a rifle. And as you can see, the picture is retouched huh, to show how they had defended their country. And of course, we can see that the way they defended their country was very heroic. Together with the English, the British armies and the French armies, they have resisted the German army over there in the west, in the southwest of Flanders. If we skip number five, Bernard, and we go to number six, that's the, what, the clock of my grandfather, which he had in his pocket. He gave it to me later on. Here you see what they were into after two weeks already. This slaughtering and butchering of the soldiers was horrible. And they were not prepared for this. Then something happens very miraculous. And this, is, this takes a, quite a great part of the story in my book. If you go on to the next image, you can see the flooded polders. No, it's not. Yes, thank you. What happened is that the armies of the Germans could not be held. This was too strong and too, too powerful for the Belgian and French and British armies. But there is one guy, the guard of the sluices near to the coast in Belgium, who floods the polders. They did this in several nights. Night after night, they went with small boats up the river, the Iser, and they opened the sluices at night and they let the polders, which are very lowlands near to the sea, they let them flood. And all of a sudden, after four or five days, the German army sank in the mud and it was finished. And there for four years, the Flemish, the British and the French soldiers defended the trenches and a war line. So Belgium was then only 10 kilometers big. This was always resting, but they kept this for four years. And my grandfather relates in detail what a hell it had been. Imagine yourself being for four years, not being inside. 
being there. There are no good toilets. Your companions are dying. It smells of dead bodies. It, you're in the mud. You're in the trenches with your feet soaked all of the time. People get colds. They get pneumonia. Very many did not die from the bullets, but from diseases. They get dysentery, diarrhea. They were very ill. They were ill fed. In summer, it was hot. There were mosquitoes, there were insects, there were infections. And all of that time, each moment you put your head above the trench, you can be killed. So this was one of the most unimaginable tragedies for which Europe was not prepared. The Flanders fields are the greatest killing fields of the beginning of the 20th century in Europe. And my grandfather was one of the first witnesses. And after 50 years, he writes the story. And 30 years later, I tried to write his story. So you see how this is an estafette of effects of how history can be relived. So I took his cahiers, his notebooks, which you have seen, in order to write his story. If you show his decorations, Bernard, in number nine, we see how important his, thank you, there you can see this is all of the huge decorations he has had. Five times he was wounded and wounded soldiers were sent over the North Sea to England. In England, wounded soldiers were taken care of. And when after three or four months of revalidation, they were good enough, even if with crutches, to return to the war, they returned to the trenches with their wounds. This is what he did. Now, I must tell you, what you will read of my grandfather is that he was not behaving like a hero. He was a very modest man. It is only in reading his cahiers, his memoirs, when I was already myself a man of more than 50 years, that I realized that the friend of my youth had been a fantastic hero. He never talked about his being a hero. When he was talking about the war, it was on the 1st of January with New Year, because there were the nice nieces and the aunts for which he could tell how horrible the, the war had been. At the same time, he was a painter and he was painting all of the time. He didn't talk about this huge honor he had had. In fact, he was a commander uh, in the Order of the Crown of Belgium. He never spoke about it. I found it all back on an attic later on. So this man, who was in fact a most naive man, had been a hero without being interested in being a hero. So this is something that was for me also very emotional. Um, I once read a, a proverb that says, real heroes do not look like heroes. Real heroes do not pose as heroes. They are just Mr. Everybody on the metro or the tramway. And they, they don't think it's special what they did. And this is the sort of guy my grandfather was. The way I have known him, um, if you can show this image, Bernard, with his uh, fedora and his bow tie, we have a very beautiful image of his bow ties, which he was wearing all the time. No, no, not this one. Uh, the bow tie, which you had before. No, 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 no. Now you're, now you're getting all these spoiler alerts already. <laughs> yes, that's okay. You can show this. That's okay. There you can see his fedor. That's okay. Yes, exactly. That's the one I meant. This is the sort of bow ties my mother made for him. He was a very aristocratic man. And you should not have guessed that he came from such a small family, but his father, as you will read in my book, had been this, this painter even in England of churches, and he himself became an artist. Um, we can show, for instance, maybe one of the paintings in which I found some of his stories. One of the, this is the Venus of Rockaby, which you can show by now. The, the Venus. Yes, thank you. 
This is one of the most world famous paintings which you can see in the London Tate Gallery. It's called The Venus of Rockaby. It's by the great painter Velázquez. I have found in the house of my parents and my great parents a copy of this painting. After the war, my grandfather became a painter and he mainly copied great paintings of Tizian, of Leonardo da Vinci, of Rembrandt, of Rubens. And this painting is a copy of a Velázquez. Why did he copy this painting? Because he was a very Catholic man. And this is a very erotic painting. What I found is that in the mirror, he did not paint the Venus Rockaby, which we see here. He painted the image of his great passion, his great love, Emilia, the girl was called, and who, was di who died in the year after the war. What you should know is that 1919, a year after the war, the war was from 1914 to 1918. In 1919, more people died from an influenza, a pandemic as we are living now with the corona, which was called the Spanish flu. More people died in 1919 of this flu, this uh, epidemic, than in the whole war. Almost 90 million people died of this influenza. And also his great love, Amelia, died. Now, my grandfather had survived this war and he had been a hero and he had seen it all, all of the atrocities and the gruesome things, but he could not bear the death of this girl. What he did, as many people in those days, he was already the friend of the family of this girl. And when the girl died, what did the family say? Would you not marry her sister? I have found in very many archives that soldiers did this. Their love was, had been dying from all sorts of infections or poverty in the war or from the Spanish flu. And very many married the sister. Now the sister of my grandfather's great love was older and she was a timid, even frigid girl. So the marriage of my grandparents was a marriage without sex. I have my mother who told me, I think they made love one time in their life. And this is when I was born, where I was born from. But for the rest, he couldn't touch her because she was frigid in a way. And I think she was even anxious that he was looking for the great love for her sister in him. So what I'm telling you is that this book, War and Turpentine, is not only about the huge tragedy for Flanders and Belgium in the First World War, where so many cruel things were happening, but also the tragedy of this man, my grandfather, who was a very interesting, joyful man, um, a painter, a naive man who had been a hero and who he became nameless. And here you see, <clears throat> thank you, Bernard. Yeah, it's okay. You can show my grandmother. <clears throat> In fact, the only great painting he made was this one. This is his portrait of my grandmother. You see her here. It's painted with the mantilla. Um, <clears throat> it's painted with the mantilla. You see the, um, the lace around her neck. You see the brooch he's wearing of ivory. He did this with very great love. Although they didn't have sex in their marriage, there was deeply deep love between those two people who had survived the cruel history of the First World War. And to me, it was a very great discovery to see how all of his memoirs were only one part of the history. The other part of his history he had hid in those paintings. He has also painted, for instance, it's still in the house of my grandparents, a huge copy of St. Martin dividing his coat because his family name was Martin. And his patron saint in Catholic belief was Martin. So he painted this Martin sharing his coat with a poor man. 
which was for him very important. He was always very solidary with poor people, with modest people, and he has remained so. Although he was a very proud man, he was always taking care of the poorer people in his family. He was very solidary with the, the fate of the poor people. So what was to me very interesting too is to see where in his paintings do I find the traces of his private history? As I showed to you in the Venus of Rockaby, to the last of his life, he has been mourning the love of his life, which was the sister of this Gabriel, her, who has imagined one time naked. He has practically never seen a woman naked in his life. This was his great sin, to imagine her naked. Just to give you one idea, when my grandmother one day was washing herself, there was no bathroom in the house, and he had, each time on Saturday, he had to go out to town when she was washing herself, so that he could not see her naked. One day he returned too early and he saw her naked, and she complained to his mother that he was such an obscene man to come back in the house. So he was weeping all of his life for the love of this lost girl. And in fact, considering Gabrielle, my grandmother, has his true friend in life, but the great love was this girl who it, he could never imagine naked. He only did it with this imaginary of the painting of Velasquez. And in this way, he gave me the testimony of his life. We have another portrait, um, Bernard, of my grandfather himself, which you just showed for a second, where he holds his hat and you see his bow tie. Yes, thank you. Now look at this painting. This is bad. This is really a, a terrible difference with the very beautiful painting of his wife, Gabrielle, and this painting. This is second rate, as if he could not paint himself. You see the look, which is a very unnatural look. He has been looking too long in the mirror to copy himself. You see his fedora, you see his bow tie. He wanted to show himself as the proud man he was also, but it's not a good portrait. And I was looking in his paintings to see, can I find a portrait where I see the soul of my grandfather? of a man who had lived in a time that I can even not imagine what he has been going through. And yes, I found a painting, a copy, and not in this original painting you see now, but in the copy you will be able to see him. And it's a copy of a very famous uh, portrait, which is called The Man with the Golden Helmet. And you will see it in a second. Thank you, Bernard. This is a very uh, famous portrait people have thought for centuries that it was by Rembrandt. They have found recently, happily my grandfather has known this, he has copied this five or six times. He had given it as a present to very many people. And I wondered what was so important that this portrait of Rembrandt to him? Well, in fact, ladies and gentlemen, this is how my grandfather looked. This is his expression when he was thinking about the war. And when we asked him, Grandad, what are you thinking of? Then he just grumbled and said, mm, let me be. This is him self-portrait hidden in a copy. So there are some very nice other themes in my book. And one of the most important is, what is originality and what is copy in the human being? Where do you copy yourself in seeing yourself in others? What is the the I, the self, and what is what you want to be for the others. And in this copy, my grandfather showed his originality. This is a very huge theory in, um, in uh, aesthetic philosophy, huh? the, the, the impossibility to be an original, that you are always a copy of something, and that even your identity in psychoanalysis is always a copy of something that you call me. This is a very interesting thing, and you will see that my book is not only about the war, it's about intimate relationships, it's about Catholicism, it's about love and passion, it's about the 
gruesome stories in the war. And I had this idea of how am I myself as the last painter in the dynasty, how am I going to write this book? And then I found this idea that you will find in the book. The book is made out of three parts. Part one, I relate how I imagine and how I uh, remind him and how I have to find him back in the time of my youth. The second part, you will hear him talking in the war. It's his voice in the trenches and the four years of war. And then in the third part, it's me again talking about him. And I would like to um, end my story by reading a part, the last pages of the book. I was, I'm writing at the end of the book about the paradox in his life, which is exactly this paradox that he could not give an image of himself and it only in copying the great paintings he could talk about the war you should know he has never painted war scenes never painted soldiers never painted things out of the first world war he only wanted to dream in the world of the former great painters and i think that maybe he had the talent to become a great painter a great flemish painter but he was broken by the war he was traumatized and the only thing he could do was copy 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 the great masters and in this copying trying to be a true authentic human being so i start reading a passage now out of the book thank you bernard can you give the image of me reading back Thank you. This paradox was the constant in his life. As he was tossed back and forth between the soldier he had to be and the artist he'd wished to become. War and turpentine. The tranquility of his final years made it possible for him to slowly overcome his traumas. Praying to Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows, he found peace. On the eve of his death, he went to bed with the words to my mother, I was so happy today, Maria. His daughter, my mother, nod nodded and gave him a good night kiss. He went to his room. There, he placed his fedora on the table by the window, as he did every night. He removed his smock, untied his black silk bow tie, and hung it carefully over the arm of the chair at his bedside. He took off his white shirt, and then his undershirt, revealing the blue indentations in his back the scars of the brutal years in the iron foundry. And when he took off his long underpants, he uncovered another bluish indentation, this one in his sagging underbelly, right next to his groin, and yet another one on his skinny thigh. The proud badges of his heroic acts inscribed in his body he put on his long flannel nightshirt and went to bed in the early morning he must have fallen ill he threw up in the large white enamel bucket beside his bed just a little gall really not even food but the kind of fluid that seems to come straight from some bad dream then he lay down again, a little sulky, a little wheezy. In his dream he got stuck in a large shrub somewhere, a bush on the verge of blowing away, with very thin branches and thorns. And like a wounded beast, he hung there, with his arms and legs spread, like an animal splayed upon, open upon a ladder and stopped breathing. All the lights in his head dimmed 
and dissolved into a dark unknown space. This foolhardy hero of the Iser front, who had risked his life time and again under enemy fire, died peacefully almost 70 years later in his sleep. His daughter found him a couple of hours later with a perfectly calm expression on his face, his lips slightly parted as if the last thing he had seen in his life had come as a pleasant surprise. Sunlight poured in through the east window. In the garden, the irises were blooming a deep blue, and wits and bells were chiming all around them. My mother hesitantly touched him. He was still warm, she later said, crying. And so, only a scrap of himself now, in a wood of memories, he rises, lighter than a plume of smoke in the wind. At the gates of his long-awaited heaven, although itching to see his loved ones again, he stands stiffly to attention and waits for attention, as if facing the army doctor in the barracks in 1900 again. Sergeant Major Marchand, St. Peter finally asks, leafing through the interminable list of wounded veterans. Non, mon commandant. Je m'appelle Martin, pas Marchand. A vos ordres. He salutes. Thank you. This hour I let my grandfather rise to his Catholic heaven. Don't think the book is only about misery. It's only about the, it's also about the beauty of life. And I think it's a huge story about what Flanders has lived and that this puzzle piece of Flanders still had to be added to the history of Europe in the First World War. And I thank you very much for having here to have been listening to me and to have assisted to my reading of this book. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. We have um, a few questions coming in, and the first question uh, is in Japanese, and, and Mayumi will uh, read it out for you and for the interpreters. Hi, コピーとオリジナリティについてソフのモシャの話は感動的でしたこの考えについて他に影響を受けた著作はありますかどういうことですかどういうことですかどういうことですかどういうことですかどういうことですかどういうことですかどういうことですかどういうことですかどういうことです
being taken up in 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 other literature i think yes i must say that for instance um as you might you will see in uh the japanese version as well in my novel are images i have photos integrated in the book i found this very interesting to do because the book is of course well in a way i have to made it up huh? but in the same time i was basing my book on true stories this is schubert for instance because my grandfather was a great admirer of schubert also and i found this method of integrating pictures and original stories into fiction in the great european writer um gw zebald zebald is the author of one of the most marvelous books about the second world war which is called austerlitz which you might know and i took this idea of integrating myself being a copyist in fact of my grandfather making a style which i call for myself autodoku fiction it's partly autobiography i'm writing about my own life and family it's documentation i did four years of research before i could write this book and it's also fiction because what i can't find out i have to fictionalize and in this way i created a sort of genre but i see now that very many contemporary writers begin to do that this will not be my influence i think it's just in the air to tackle historical themes in an autobiographical way by making your own link with the story and in the same way doing your research your documentary research and where there are gaps you fill them in with fiction i've been publishing three books in this way now thank you and uh, thank you very much uh, stefan and then related to that there is uh, one more question and also in Japanese, so I, I let Mayumi uh, read it. I have here uh, a question in English. So um, you were um, well, talking about his 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 art, and and um, it's also intertwined with with the the love story uh, of his life. So there is the original, and there is sorry, you can so uh, sorry. Let me let me repeat it. So. Um, your book is, is there is a, a true love story in it. So there is the original and there is the copy. After his first great love um, dies, he settles for his sister. So uh, a copy of the original, so to speak. So Absolutely. because they are twin sisters. So there the, the theme of um, uh, art comes again and how to say. Uh, Absolutely. Right. This Yes, 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 this is a very good remark. Um, this is the irony of the story, of course. Um, he married the copy of his great love and he became a copyist. So this is tragical, but it's also, yes, it has an ironical aspect in itself. It must have been tragical for him. And I ask in the novel, I ask you as a reader in the novel, how it must be if you think that you can love a copy of your love. I think this is horrible. You should look for somebody completely different because otherwise you you remain in this dollar and i think this must have been for my grandparents something very painful and i think this is why my grandmother refused intimate intimate love with him because i think she feared that he was looking for her for the other one but of course you should imagine these people lived in a time where there was no psychoanalysis. They could not say, I'm frustrated, I'm traumatized or anything. There was no Freudian language. There was just silence. 
There were Catholic people. They were praying in church and they did not talk about this for all of this, their lives. So how did he live with the copy of himself? How did he live with the copy of his wife? How did he live with the copies of his paintings? Um, we are moving out the house where he has lived now. We, we keep finding copies of masters. So this is also the story of repression, repression of dollar, repression of sadness, repression of your melancholy. And then to me, the marvel of the story remains, and I hope I have shown this in the book, that it's also very beautiful. This is a romantic man. This is a man who could weep when he saw flowers. This is a man who was amazed when he saw in the 80s, when he saw buoyings in the sky and said, isn't this beautiful? But immediately in seeing a buoying, he started talking about what was for him to copy, the German uh, aviators who flew over the trenches very low to in, in order to bomb them. So whatever you asked him, there was always an original in the copy. You gave him a cup of coffee and he said, thanks for the coffee, but you know, the coffee in the trenches was horrible. You couldn't drink it. So everything was a copy of his life. And all of his life is, there is a, a motto in the book of Zebald, who asks, how do you live your life as an afterlife? When everything, which was so horrible, you lived before your 26 years, and that everything that comes after is not an original life anymore. So it goes very deep. The story of copy and original goes even into the psychoanalytical question and into the tragedy of his life and into religion as well. Thank you. And um, furthermore, to, to this, there is a question of, um, yeah, you can look at it uh, broadly and, and see what is the meaning of art in society. Uh, about the, the the healing, the comforting, and the connecting part of um, art and 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 the meaning of art in in the world. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. This is of course the great question of Aristotle and Plato, um, certainly of Aristotle in in inventing the notion of catharsis. Can you have a cathartic feeling with art? Can art give us something in return for the horror of the world? If I look at my grandfather. I think, yes, there was comfort for him in art. Absolutely. Um, I describe in the book also that when he was hearing Schubert, he was weeping or he went out. He had become very sentimental, as very many of those boys. There are stories when they came back from the war and they were wounded, they lost a leg or they, they lost an arm or something. And when they were taken care of by the nurses in England, they, they would weep when they smelled just the smell of hot milk, of somebody ironing clothes. They started weeping because all of their emotions were broken. So how could you find catharsis? How could you find comfort in life again? This is a central question, which is in very many novels about warfare. And I think for my grandfather, I should answer the question, yes, there is some sort, some sort of consolation. But if you ask me as a writer, in fact, I remain angry. Because I think that all the cruelties of the world, think at the Holocaust and the Second World War, think about what happened to Japan. You can not make up for it. The only thing you can do is keep telling it, keep telling stories, keep reminding new generations. I once read in Warsaw, where there's a great Holocaust museum, I read a fantastic sentence, which is, everybody who hears the story of a witness becomes himself a witness. So by reading my book, you become a witness. And we all become witnesses if we want to be open to stories, but we cannot make up for it. I don't think art makes the world better. But I think we should keep telling stories. And my great master, Zebald, once wrote that what we should try to do in literature is bring restitution. Restitution, maybe not consolation, but restitution. 
happen because we cannot bring those people back. If you are a Jewish uh, person, if you're a Japanese person, European person, and you have lost all of your family in a war, you cannot bring them back with art. Art can have some consolation for us, but it cannot restore. And the older I get, the more this. art cannot restore. Maybe it can warn. That's already something. Um, thank you very much, Stefan. So there is um, one more question or maybe more a kind of remark. How do young people relate to older people? So in War and Turpentine, there is um, the respect for the elder people is still very uh, great, a, a little bit like the Japanese society. Meanwhile, with, with all the progress that we made, uh, we have gone backwards uh, tremendously in, in that respect. How, how do you feel about that? Yes, that's a great theme, of course. And I see myself that um, when I look at the 80 or 100 people in the room when I give a lecture, very many of them have gray hair. That's true. Um, maybe it also has to do with the fact that only later in life you begin to read. I'm not too pessimistic. Um, this book, for instance, War and Turpentine, was in the running for a very special prize, which is called the Inked Ab, the Ink Monkey. And it's a prize being given by scholar, by, by young students in um, secondary schools. So a public of between 16 and 19 years old. Now each year they can choose one book who has had many prizes as their favorite book. Now this book about the war was chosen by more than 100,000 students in Flanders and, Be and Holland as the Ink Monkey Prize. So I was very amazed to see that young people were moved by the story. I think this is because the story has very many emotions. And to me, it's very important in literature to bring in emotions in your philosophies, that you can move people by it. Of course, I know that also in our societies, the respect for elder people has gone down. This is true in a way. But it is also my experience when you remain dignified, when you remain just yourself, I have always been a teacher for students for 40 years. <clears throat> I've had, because I was teaching in an, an art academy, I had the most hip and alternative and progressive students out of it. And they've always accepted me because I try to be like them, not in a coquettish way, just to, not to be trying younger than you are, but just by being in your world and in their world, in today's world. So I keep up with uh, actual, history with actual fashion with actual things actual movies etc in order to be able to talk also their language and i've seen it with my own son who's 25 he started reading when he was 23 and now he's studying philosophy so everything at its time i was forced in my study to read franz kafka when i was 19. did i understand it was this a better culture i don't think so so I give them a break. I know they're reading a lot. The best of them are reading long reads, are learning to see things, and they're opening up. But this stands apart, of course, of the question, where's the respect for elder people? And there, politically speaking, for instance, I don't know. I don't think that the cisgender boomers of my generation have better answers for the crisis we're in. We have to do it together in all classes of uh, age we're in. There are three great new things. There is pandemic, there is climate crisis, and there is migration crisis. And we cannot solve this with the wisdom of the so-called elder because we don't know either. We have to do it all together. So for me, the most important things is that over the ages and over the years, we start talking all with people younger people, elder people. I see very many beautiful things happening in the world as well with the young climate crisis people. It's the younger people now telling the elder people what to do. So I'm not too worried about this.
Thank you. Okay, and then um, a, a, a final question coming from myself, uh, because I, I know you're lecturing about this, and um, I, I would like you a, a little bit to, to elaborate on the difference between uh, remembering and, and commemorating. Ah, oh, thank you. Oh, yes. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. because I think this is might be very valuable for you. Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Bernard. Um, I have written uh, uh, um, at a certain moment a few years ago, I had to do a great reading, a, a lecture, a, a special official lecture in Amsterdam. And they asked me to reflect on this book on war and turpentine, which moreover, I have here in Japanese also in my hands. And I thought, what is different with this book? Why has this book sold so many copies? Why is it translated in 28 languages? What has happened? What have I done that this happened to me? And then I saw this difference Bernard is talking about, that maybe my book is not just remembrance of something official. It's not commemoration. It's not the talk of politicians. It's not the official talk about the wars how good they might be it's about remembering and remembrance is something intimate it touches your own body and what i want to do in this book is that when you have read it you cannot forget my grandfather that you will remember him as a type of human being that you know maybe yourself and your grandparents or that you remember from people and that you say i recognize him it's universal this is not just flemish this is about something intimate that everybody knows and this is the great difference i think that memories and remembrance are intimate and touch your heart and touch your emotions and move you while commemoration is okay but it's political it's official and this is a huge difference and i've seen myself that in all the commemorations we had in 1914 1918 in flanders fields you know there was something very beautiful there was a ritual at a certain moment where at the front line of 60 kilometers people were holding hands for 60 kilometers with candles in their hands this was huge as a commemoration and the other commemoration was touching the emotion of the memory and the remembrance. And I think if there is something literature can do, it's to make the historical facts again into an intimate personal story. This is very important to me, that a writer can tell a huge story, like the story of Flanders in the First World War, as a story of everybody. I think this is important. Thank you. Uh, so finally, to, to conclude, I think there is, uh, in, in your book, there is uh, different themes that you ju juxtapose, uh, say, poverty against culture, uh, art versus war, and love versus hate and fear. So these are the big themes that you um, so beautifully uh, intertwine in, 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 in your work. Uh, would you be able to elaborate a, bit, a little bit on that? <laughs> well, yeah. uh, not, not to turn it too philosophical, but uh. of course I was formed at university with Hegel's idea of dialectics. Mm -hmm. Dialectics are for me, Hegel once said about dialectics because in his time, in, um, in 19th century, there were some philosophy professors opposed to his theory of dialectics. And Hegel said, it doesn't interest me whether you are in favor of the dialectic theory or not. You're living in it. You're always living in oppositions. You're always living in things that tear you apart. Um, and this dialectic thing, this fact that you have one given thing, one situation, another situation will change the facts, will change the game. And then it is your task to see how the changing situation, the antithesis, as Hegel calls it, will change the thing and you will go to a new synthesis. So things are always opposed in your life. It's about, even in love it is, there is in the first place your sexuality, there's in the other place your sentimentality. For very many people, they do not go together and they should go together with your emotion and your sex. So even in 
love, even in hatred, even in politics, even in art, you always have black and white. And of course, this interests me very much. I will give you another example of the black and white. I think I've written a very beautiful and moving book with Warren Turpentine, but isn't it obscene to make beautiful art out of the horror my grandfather has gone through? It's always double. You're always living in a double situation. And this interests me very much indeed. How the sublime and the horror, for instance, you will find in the book very many scenes which are horrible, hor um, which are horrible, but at the same time have a very great beauty. I give you the scene, which is maybe for me the central scene in the book. My grandfather is 13 years old. And because they're poor, he has to go to work in the iron foundry, which is like the hell of Dante. He works in the hell. He's almost burned alive at the, the melting of the iron and the great spoons that he has to hold as a boy. And at a certain moment, the iron dr spills over and his boots are in iron that, that gets solid and they have to take him out because it's almost burning. This is one for me. This is one of the central scenes in the book for me, because there you see the sublime. The guy thinks he's going to heaven because he's getting out of conscience. He's like an angel. And at the same time, it's, it's pure horror. It's an, it's an infant. It's a boy of 13 working in the iron foundry. So this double sense of everything in war and turpentine is one of the main things. And I think that even the title shows this. War in Turpentine is quite a strange title, isn't it? It doesn't go together. This is a stylistic figure. Uh, that's things that do not go together and that you put them together. Even in this title, you can see there is something going on which is very strange. What is War in Turpentine? This is the life of people. You have art and you have war. You have horrible, horrible things and you have beauty. And this is what we're living through now. If you look at the journal and the news every day, you see horrible things every day and you try to have beauty in your life. So this is what literature is about, I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan Hedmans. I think this is a very beautiful note uh, to finish on to. Um, okay, let me... Uh, take this occasion to to thank you uh, very much for being here with us tonight. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for uh, being ready to to interact with the, the Japanese audience and for sharing so generously your thoughts and ideas. It's um, at the same time very personal, but you're dealing with with the the big themes and the big issues, so it makes it a more interesting. So it was a, a very uh, how to say. Uh, deep and, and with deep insights um, fulfilled presentation. And so we hope that um, based on, on this, that, um, well, all those who haven't been able to, to, to buy your book yet, and then now will be running to the, the bookstore and, and uh, buy it. So uh, again, the book has been translated into Japanese and is available in uh, the bookstores. Um, I would like to, to take uh, this opportunity uh, to, to thank also the uh, EU delegation very much uh, for organizing these sessions so meticulously, so meticulously and also especially I would like to, to single out um, Ms. Hiroko Takebe for her uh, great efforts and her contributions in this. And uh, finally and lastly, I would like to thank the audience, everybody who uh, tuned in uh, from wherever country you're looking from. We hope um, that you all have uh, enjoyed very much uh, this session and we hope to see you again next year for uh, the next uh, session of, uh, Europe, of the European Literature Festival. But then we hope we can see one another live here um, in Japan. So, um, Stefan, once more, thank you very much. and. Um, so on, on this note, uh, I think we can conclude uh, this beautiful uh, evening. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.